Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast, the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT to discuss their lives, their journeys and their ambitions with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. And it's only ever been called that since Lee Johnston joined the uh, the TT show. Oh. Prior to that, no one cared about the TT. Or me. Who are you? <laughs> But you're still with us, unfortunately, um, because Steve Plater is away. How are you finding this so far? Do you far? think this is an upgrade? No, not at all. I was talking about me. Oh, oh, right. Okay. Well, rather than being on the bike. Confused now, I think you? people would rather see you on the bike. I do too. And not hear you. I would rather be on the bike. I think most people would rather Not that I don't on, like you, but I would rather be on the bike. I would rather be on a bike. It's quiet there. Peace and quiet. Don't have to look at me. <laughs> don't deal with me. Now, I'm talking of, of, uh, of being on the bike... We're going to get a man on who has, has been on a lot of bikes in a short space of time. Mike Russell, did you know this? Attempted to race both sidecar and solos back in 2022 and in 2023. So eight races he took part in. And you have a you, you whinge when you have to do six laps on a big bike. And how does your six laps go on your big bike? Uh, well, I'll tell you when I do them. Was the first pit stop the worst or the second? I nailed them all, mate. You nailed, oh, so you did the pit stop as well as riding Got the bike? Got off the bike, put it on the paddock stand. Tell you what, if there ever was a one-man band, <laughs> you're like that guy that has the drum on the back, cymbals going, shaker in one hand. <laughs> and the harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me. You're not quite Mike Russell, though, are you? I'm not. But you know who is? Mike Russell. <laughs> Let's get him on. I'm going to start with this quote. In 2022, Mike Russell became the first person since Ernie Coates in 1979 to start every race, both solo and sidecar. And then you did it again in 2023. I was just a runner at Rob Ernie's face, and it wasn't he's done it twice now. Yeah. Well, when I first Screw met you, Ernie, Ernie, let's face it, Ernie's <laughs> a bit of a legend around the park, yeah. as everyone knows. And generally speaking, when I found out that he'd done Sidecarin as well, mm -hmm. it was like, blew my mind. But then to find out who's the passenger for his brother is just incredible. Because I'm not being funny. I think Lee's done a bit of passengering once or yeah. twice and, and had some stories to tell. If you're a racer in, in the TT, you're on a different level mm -hmm. in terms of you're in that zone. But then you've got to put yourself in that position where you know exactly where you're going. Obviously, it's with his brother. But then you've got to take that brain out and just be the passenger and hold on. That was probably front, front exit and all that jazz back in the day as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you know what that means? So like now let's I set it, a car. I know what a... Yeah. I know what a front yeah. exit just, yeah. just not really clued up on what, what it makes. So we're just getting that. He's getting there though. He's done a few. At least you're old, enough, you're old enough to know what a front exit is. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about sidecar still. But yeah. Let's just say we were. Yeah. When, when, you, when you say that though, like because it's like... It's like driving with your Mrs. Driving, do you know what I mean? Mm. You're a bit on edge, but you yeah. imagine having all the control and then having none, none of either. the control. It's yeah. like, well, you obviously do because a passenger is very valuable in a side car. You Absolutely. Can't... And if you speak to any passenger, they're like, it's 50 50 or 60 40 to them. Yeah. I'm not, I'm a bit of a control freak. I and mean, I did one lap on the back of a side car just to experience what, it. What, round here? Not round here. Oh, right. No. Jesus Christ. Around the short circuit. Yeah. You know, Gary Brown was like, get on the back and just see what... So the... you appreciate the passenger, appreciate it. yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that. I was like tapping the fuck out of him going, please stop. Slow down. And he was just going half speed. He was just rolling around just to give me an experience. Just tickling it. One lap and I was if, like... Have you ever had a go in a safe car? No. No. Uh, you, sh you should. You, I have you, offered. Yeah, you, sh you should do that. Offered. I think, yeah, you should. And I really want to. Especially like something that... Because you have to not... Like, this thing of, oh, I'll just throw you out. They could so easily do that. But if you get in... Like, I've been in with someone that really knew what they were doing and someone that really didn't. So I went with Burchill's first <laughs> and Dean Harrison second. So I, I've had both sides yeah. of the thing. And obviously when I got in with someone that knew what they were doing, I stayed in the sidecar. And when I got in with someone that did didn't... Oh, did I? Dean? Yeah, cut my whole hand, yeah. fingers off. Thumb. That was around Jerby, wasn't it? Yeah. Like the day before the 350 race, yeah. Yeah. Really? But... um. Yeah, you should you should get in, I believe, just oh. to understand. I've said it time you and again. You could do a period lap, maybe. Well, we've 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 maybe offered and around, tried yeah. it a few times, but obviously there is legalities in there. I wanted to try and come over and do the tire testing this year, yeah. but mm. obviously just take someone else out 
again, you're just tire testing. Yeah. Um, and but, you think uh, would the would the weight be an issue or would that be make it go oh, faster, more stable, if anything? Yeah, but right. on the uphill bits, you know, <laughs> you have to take everything into consideration. But the, the moves would be hindering. Yeah. We've got enough gears what? to go down pecs. to get the the packs. Sorry, the packs. Yeah, we're just short. We're short. Gear it short for him. Look at that. Why is it packing out? The people, the people on. That's with the brow on as well. That's, <laughs> that's impressive. The people man. listening the won't appreciate shot. just how much movement there is in these pegs. Oh yeah. Moving I'll just, tables I'll just trace it. when you're running. Can we start? Can we get in? Can we start this podcast, yeah. please? Oh, I thought we. We kind of have started, but oh, okay. we always have to start with the same question because you all obviously listen to every episode of the podcast. Absolutely, lately. What's your favourite episode so far? Uh, I genuinely like the first one. Which was. Lee Johnson safe, one. Safe answer. I was it was it? No. No, it nearly. Was, was it John or it was either John or Pete? Well, I don't um, know which episode it was, but it was he was the first recorded. I was only episode, only one and someone else. But you were number it, you know, five. What? You were the first recorded, but yeah. you were number five. How, how does that work? Because it was a pilot. It was you a didn't bit of think a I was a big enough name. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, be, like, to be launched. Well, it, it'll do. Let's chuck it out. They're yeah. all good. They're all good, and hopefully this one will be just as good. Oh, this Even is already these, off to a great you know, start. This five head on the front, you know. I didn't realise it was actually being recorded. I thought it was just... Would you have done your hair? What, at the back? Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, my point being, when we start the podcast, we always start with the same question. question. And because you've raced both sidecars and solo, and you've done them so many times, you'll have a decent experience of it. But that rolling up to the start line, especially in no man's land, because that seems to be where the tension is. Even as a spectator, even when you're just stood in there, you can feel it because all of a sudden you've gone from being with your team and then literally it's mechan- uh, no mechanics, riders only, and yeah. you're th- riding through, rolling through, you get that grab on the shoulder, mm. you're waiting for that tap. What's what's going through your head during that time? So for me, um, it's the build-up starts long before, as you know, and then as soon as you get that... I don't, element- I don't know, Mike. I've never done it. I was actually talking to Lee. He's got no idea. I was looking at Lee there just for a bit of reassurance. He's like that. I just got on a bike and go really fast. (laughs) But for me, yeah. But what we, what, how, how long? Like as soon as you wake up in the morning, or for like an hour, or an hour. Depends on the time of the race, doesn't it? Yeah, from from sort of like this morning, I'm already buzzing about getting out for sort of midday. Well, whatever, one o'clock. Yeah, you know what I mean. So uh, the build-up for me starts the night before because I can't sleep, Mm -hmm. and then I get going. You struggle, like, so even in practice week, would you struggle to sleep? or? Yeah, because I, I just think I overthink a lot of stuff, you know, where you, you just, like, TT this year was horrendous because there were so many different breaking points, markers, blah, 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 that I actually just found, I mean, I, I was having to take sleep, sort of sleeping tablets to try and get a half-decent yeah. night's sleep mm-hmm. because it was just, you know, I'd message the missus and whatever else in the morning, I'd be like, I haven't slept at all because I'm just constantly thinking about stuff. Mm-hmm. Which is great because I think you've got to appreciate the fact that it is you've got to do your homework and everything else. Yeah, sleeping but, is also great. <laughs> but sleeping is definitely <laughs> it's good. amazing. But we don't, you know, at my age, it's like one of them. You, you can survive two weeks without any sleep, and then you just need to crash. So that's what we did. Sleep we just is in crash, sleep so. crash. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fingers crossed, not the other crash. <laughs> and, and that's my goal as well. You know, I always ride within sort of hundred percent of me or ninety percent of my limit as such, which is nowhere near. You know, that's probably 75% of no. these limit. You know what I mean? It's that sort of thing. Everyone has that different um, Level, threshold. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. You, I, you I, didn't uh, mention uh, Chris's sort of level. or so there is, Cycling. There is, no, level. there is no threshold. Oh. I don't have a threshold. I'm just... Boof. He just goes through the threshold. Yeah. Through the floorboards. Through the floorboards. <laughs> Do, job done. But Any, yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. No going back to it, we'll actually answer through. the question. But, uh, yeah. As soon as my... I, I'm quite... Nervous and apprehensive within not being sick behind trees and all that good stuff, but I'm sort of just getting mellowly level. And excited. Excited. Nerve. A little bit buzzy. Yeah. A bit buzzy. Uh, until I get my helmet on. Mm-hmm. And as soon as my visor goes down, it's a really weird sensation. I noticed it the first time I ever did the Manx. So I'd only been riding a couple of years before I started racing the TT circuit mm-hmm. of the Manx. Um, so for me, it's like just get a helmet on, go riding around the roads, go to a track day. Literally don't sleep before because you're so excited. Came to do the Isle of Man, and it was a very surreal experience. So I put my helmet on to do my first newcomer's lap, and I was setting off behind um, Chris Palmer, who was an absolute hero to mm-hmm. me at the time. You know, sort of just getting into racing and finding out who these people were, and then I find out I'm setting off with Chris Palmer. Mega, he just pulled wheelies all the way around it and just fucked about. Um, 
but it was an amazing experience. But as soon as I put my helmet on, um, everything changed. My helmet, my breathing changed, my, like my eyesight changed, everything mm-hmm. changed. Like the focus just went from blase, whatever's going on in Jack's world, to looking straight down that, that, that line as such. And it still does it now. As soon as I put my helmet on and I flick the visor down, I'm in my own world. And it's it's almost like, uh, I was trying to explain it to someone this year. So, you know, in my respect to other riders, we're all sort of superheroes in terms of the battles you take to get to that start line yeah. with yourself. I mean, there was a prime example yesterday, walking up to get onto my bikes yesterday. There was a guy literally sort of, not panicking, but you could just see him just sort of pacing up and down, sort of, you know, in a world of his own. Yeah. And that's his own battle to try. And then obviously later on, I saw him getting up there, getting on his bike. Yeah. But he's battling with himself, you know, and I battle myself. I've got two kids at home. I've got one that's, you know what I mean? It's, there's life goes on. Mm-hmm. We've all got family. We've all got responsibilities. But there is a massive battle for me to get onto that bike every single day. Mm-hmm. As soon as the lid goes on and as soon as that visor comes down, it's almost like nothing else matters. You're in that mirrored dark visor. Yeah. No one can see what your eyes are doing. So yeah. it's like you, you're in your own head and that's when your breathing goes, you, you can feel you, you can feel your heart pumping. Yeah. It's so surreal. Um, and, and it's only an experience that, you know, obviously Lee's will be slightly different. Lee's probably just lo- no. joking and <laughs> messing around before yeah. he gets on. You know what I mean? So everyone similar, has their own Everybody different... is a similar... Th- but yeah, one question I wanted to ask was, like, what, what was your, like, sort of normal start numbers for the TT? Because, so, like, when he says he puts his helmet on, is that, like, so say the, the top 10 or whatever, they put their helmet on, they're literally going. We You literally go straight away, yeah. you know what I mean? Because there's maybe only 40 seconds to someone if you're starting at three or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the, the thing that people forget is if you're off at... 30 or 40 or whatever you have to listen to all these bikes mm. go and you maybe put your helmet on because there's been announcements so then you get a bit excited and you get on you think oh i've got another four or five minutes to yeah or more yeah, yeah. so it's it i that would be worse for me do you know what i mean yeah i think and i actually have thought about that before even mm. like now when i'm going up to watch i think oh he's and I've, I've spotted people going he's got his helmet on already and it's like he's got five minutes to wait do you know what yeah. i mean yeah it, so, yeah it's, it's strange that there's tire warmers still on bikes Yet the race has technically begun because oh, the yeah. first few of yeah. So does that like in different classes were you in like a big variation of number difference or are you similar in them all? Uh, well, this or? year I, I always aim for number fifty five just yeah. because it's my my number, but I never get it. Yeah, I've, I think about it once. Um, so if we do try and get this challenge done again, I'd, I'd like to try and say fifty five. Obviously, they're going to be fifty five sidecar sadly, but um, you know we have started in front of you once. Yeah, uh, finished in front of me because he broke down. But uh, yeah, I've got some nice picture of you and that was a sort of, you know, and it's like little ticks in the box. Like, yeah, yeah. I've, you know, started with you, started with Rutter, uh, started with Josh Brooks and, and sort of kept you yeah. in sight for, I know this can sound daft, but as a rider like myself, if I can keep someone like Lee in sight for four or five miles, that's like a little, yeah. do you know what? Yeah. I, I can sort of ride a bike-ish, you know, because <laughs> I don't, you know, it's, it's really hard because you, for the first sort of, four or five TT Manx Grand Prix, I never got passed by anyone. Yeah. Because you're sort of coming up or starting at the back and just coming through the back markers. Mm. Um, and then I came to TT in 2015, I think it was. Uh, and I remember, uh, and it was so surreal, because obviously you're so used to coming up behind people, having given them respect yeah, to yeah. say, when can you make a safe pass? Yeah. And as a privateer, we're on sort of fairly standardish bikes. They're on fairly standish bike so there's there's yeah, not there's that not massive lot. speed difference where they can just blast past and um it was um it was john mcginnis it was this was all on one lap as well so it's all over the mountain i came up mountain mile michael rutter came past me going into uh, guthrie's uh and i was just like fuck me that's michael rutter uh <laughs> john mcginnis came past me just before the right hand kink before um sort of veranda area and I was like, oh my God, that is John McGuinness. You know, and I was just like, and it, you do actually have to sort of snap yourself out of it yeah, because I'm starstruck. I was yeah. just like, you know, Rutter's my hero, John McGuinness, all these guys are my heroes. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm actually, and then the last one was Cam Donald. And I was just like, fucking hell, that's Cam <laughs> Donald. So I literally just like got passed by these three guys that were on stupendously fast bikes, yeah. you know, 
and that there was no chance of staying with them for three miles. It was three seconds, you know. Coming and on. I was just like, and I'm there thinking. Actually, I did think to myself, "Fuck me, that's the first time I've properly been passed." Mm. You know, not just where you're having a little ba battle with someone or just having a slow moment, and just someone comes past and you get pa past them. The the leads have come off me because they've gone past me that fast. And I was yeah, like, but always in crazy. a like in a sea of because they're at the level that they are, do you know what I mean? They don't tend to stripe you. It's near, you're nearly worse. Do you know if like you're like um, a little bit similar in speed, mm -hmm. you almost have to yeah. make more of a dodgy move. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, whereas like, you're watching British Championship, you catch a back marker, unless it falls really awkwardly for mm. you, it's you pretty much quite a fast. quick pass yeah. and no one's affected. Whereas in the race, you've more chance of striping people, yeah. you know, like, or, or you know, it's a bit, a bit more that. iffy, yeah, because they're they're on their limit and you're on your limit. It's like, oh, whereas yeah. if there's a bit of a gap and and it's they go, oh, I'll just get through there, and that's that's literally the thought that's process it. of it. So everyone's safe. And have yeah. you had any? Have you had? Have you had any close? The the scariest part for someone. for um, I don't want to say like top teeth, but like the faster sort of end of the TT guys. But if we come to the Manx and I'm on a like a 500 classic, is that what they're, like a classic, senior, five, classic, yeah, bike. senior classic bike. So it's, it's not very fast, it'll do 130 or 40 mile an hour. But we might end up being out with a kid in the Manx that's on a super sport bike. Yeah. And like places where, um, like sort of through Kurt Michael or out the other side, I'll just be flat out and my brain will not even, because it's flat out on a 600 or a super bike as well. So you're, you're just, this is, you're just sitting doing what you do. And some kid might pass you in a bit of a straight before, mm -hmm. and he's only learning. It's not that it's not his fault or anything, but he'll sit up to break somewhere where I'm like not even, <laughs> yeah. and I have like properly striped two or three kids, and it's like that. It scares me. I can't even imagine what, he, what like he's like literally thought. But the, a the brakes don't work on a classic brake, so pulling them is like pointless. <laughs> but like literally, I was like, it, it was like sitting on the motorway and someone deciding to get out to go to the toilet well in the fast lane yeah, do you know yeah. mean? it's like it's not it's not happening but that it doesn't happen at the TT very often or basically never but there that I've had two or three where I've gone oh my day so I'd even be re like now I'd be like super cautious when I'm up behind someone I would never like try and get a draft or anything yeah. because no, no. I'd, I'd be on the other even if the other side of the road is the wrong side of the road it's I'd be over safe, there yeah. because I can just go on yeah yeah yeah, that is uh, yeah. Uh, pretty scary, that. <laughs> yeah. It can be. And that's the thing, isn't it? I had it last night. Lad on a 6.50 came past me, coming into Schoolhouse Corner. Yeah. So into Schoolhouse Corner, he came past me on that little blast and then literally just... just and my brakes don't work. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, right, I'm just going to have to let off and go underneath him. Yeah. Yeah. And it was as simple as that because I had, he actually could stop. I can't stop. Yeah. You're using that momentum and the, yeah. brake, the fact that the wooden brakes don't work. So... Wooden but they are. They it's, are it very, is scary. Like very, you imagine, are they that yeah. bad? Yeah. Well, it, it they're not that. They're they're perfectly good. But when everyone else has them, then you're all like, if you go to yeah, Goodwood Revival, yeah. that's yeah. fine. But when you've got somebody with a modern brake and he grabs that thing, yeah, that, you yeah. are not. You might as well not bother breaking yeah. because what you are going to do is not going to yeah affect the situation. Yeah, you're going to affect it when you smash it in the back of him. Yeah. So and that's the thing, I, I've come to, TT for me is just, you know, and that's why I said I ride within 90% of my limit as such. Yeah. Because I think, I mean, last, you know, the other night, you know, you come back a gear, uh, it doesn't come back a gear, it's under false neutral. So, you you know, if I didn't have that 90%, if I went in there 100 yards later yeah. or 50 yards later, yeah. I wouldn't have that comfort zone and it would be a case of I'm sailing off the mountain. Yeah. And I've got, my ambition is to be 60 year old. I want to be Dave Molyneux. Mm-hmm. And still racing, if they will allow me, you know, if I'm still at that pace that I can race. Yeah. Um, Surely another year's in years. Yeah, it's only a year. <laughs> <laughs> Three more years, thank you. You could have him and you and Pritchard could both be sixty then, and it could be the. Could Wait, be you the saying no, I look like that? If it, I look as young as that, I'd be well up. Thank you, mate. It could thank be you. the one twenty. No, the yeah. one twenty. Yeah. Club. <laughs> the one. The what? Well, two sixties in it. One twenty. <laughs> <laughs> Do you the 120 club? club yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Not in speed, but in, yeah. in lifetime. <laughs> Years. <laughs> Start at number 60. Oh, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's my goal. I love TT. I live for TT. I yeah. live, for, live for racing this circuit. No one else really sort of... People don't understand that side of things. They're like, do you do short circuit? If I had the money to, absolutely. Yeah. Because I think it keeps you sharp. Yeah. But Northwest... Th th this is a common you know, question in this. Like, I, well, I ask Mike and different people, like, if 
I always want to know if other people feel like I feel like when they ride on a short circuit, how does that make you feel? When you ride the Northwest or the TT, he doesn't even answer. He just shook yeah. his head. You know, it's like the not. It's well. It's what, sad to say it. Yeah, it really is sad. So I was very late starting in riding bikes. I was twenty, mid twenties, early mm-hmm. twenty three. So as soon as I started riding bikes, I was like, "This is mint. I love it. Let's do a track day. Wow, this is amazing." You know that sense of speed. Which the fact. What was your first track? Cadwell Park. Oh, of all the of all the places to go. Cadwell yeah. Park, absolutely yeah. love it there. Anyway, long story short, that was it. And then I thought, do you know what? And so someone said, oh, you know, you're quite quick. You might want to start racing. I was like, I've only been riding two weeks, but thank you anyway. Nice. Started bought a Honda Hornet, did that Super Club with New Era. Next year, did Super Stock, crashed while doing all right in the championship, and that's when I first sort of met yourself and a few others. Um, and was doing all right. I think we were sixth in the championship up until Fruxton and then I had a massive crash at, at church. This um, is like the fastest corner in British championship. So yeah. it's, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's the fast that why ride. it's called church or was there a church it's, there? Yeah, I think you something? pray if you crash there, you pray. Like is that coming into the... Onto the in, back straight. Right, back yeah. straight. Yeah, yeah, fast so ride. Probably yeah. 120 or 30 mile an hour corner, maybe more. Probably more, more I'd yeah. said. You're back to, yeah, probably you just know, back it's, to fifth. It's then. literally back to fifth, no brakes, push it in and, and drive through it. And as soon as I went into that corner, it was like the fourth lap of the race. And I was, I think I was in about 10th place. I was like, I'm up here. You know, we sort of, we're up with the gaggle of riders and I'm, I'm just learning. You know, yeah. I was learning racecraft. I was learning everything else. The Hornets taught me a bit of racecraft, but you know, at that speed, we were learning a bit more racecraft because it was slightly different. And I just went into it and I just felt the front tuck and I was like, oh, fuck. And it was mm-hmm. like that. And I just... Went off, barrel rolled, the bike was barrel rolling next to me. And and that was it, unfortunately. Financially, I couldn't repair the bike. You know, and, and to be fair, that was the next year we'd planned to obviously get a bit of money together, rebuild the bike, do super stock again next year. Mm-hmm. And then I got called up to go to Iraq. So I was like, brilliant, perfect timing. I think it was like March the 18th, I was due to go to Iraq. So that was the whole of pretty much that BSB season finished but that's where the tt came in mm-hmm. so there can't be anyone else said the misty your reason because they were in iraq this has to be the only you know, some so people casually. have got hurt they had to go to work <laughs> yeah yeah so we missed that and then we went to iraq that is like <laughs> that is not a sentence that has been we'll said get, we'll yeah. get onto that later right yeah please i hope, I hope we do but so going on, so, so this is how the love affair came with, with the, the man because it was never on my bucket list it was my bucket list you know in terms of i'd watched every what they called vh vhs things you know I don't know that two, that old tapes that? you know VHS? the old tapes yeah, no. dvds before um, dvds yeah i've heard of dvds these big square black things you put them in a slot for people like myself yeah at my yes. age yeah. i remember Chris. the vhs's i remember vhs's yeah oh, i've no doubt in that whatsoever <laughs> He's trying to reassure himself there. That was it. We, we were at that <laughs> era where we yeah. could... Yeah. And they're worth a bloody fortune, then. If you've got a BHS that still works... Still got one. Oh, of course he has. They're probably worth... Well, so you'd to watched, the right collection. you'd watched all the TV, oh, but been never, thought, never thought fixated. about it. But this is the thing. I'd watched the VHSs, I'd watched the DVDs, and loved it, and just been like, that as a is fan, absolutely no, amazing. A... Watched it on boards and thought, fuck that. Yeah. How do they know what they're doing? Because it is just... Blurry yeah. as hell, but never actually was. I'm going to race a motorbike at the TT. That mm-hmm. was never on that bucket list of of things to do. My bucket list of riding was first of all mid twenties, get a bike, yep. tick that box, do a track day. Fucking loved it. Start racing, thinking I was going to be the next Valentin Rossi. Did okay, and then obviously the Iraq side of things. And to be fair, if you look back at it, at the time I was devastated because it's like all I wanted to do was go racing yeah. that next year. Um, so at that time I was just like kicking off at work. I was like, seriously, just send someone else. I'll go, you know, over Christmas time, whatever. Just let me do this super stock championship. Sorry, mate, you've got to go. But in hindsight, it's what actually obviously got me got to here. here. Yeah. Um, because years, Gordon Blackley, you know, Raf, very good rider back yeah. in the day had rang me the year before, I think it was and said, look, you know, I'm going to be retiring out of the Raf." Uh, Motorsports Association, we're giving up the sort of BSB and all that stuff, and TT, you know, you're doing Superstock, you're going into Superstock, do you fancy doing TT? I was like, fuck, 
that. Oh, really? Yeah, Did, oh, yeah. Well, that was your first... That's strange, isn't it? Because there's not many... Yeah, yeah, because, because of I'd just... only been riding a bike oh. like a year and a half, two years at this point, if that in total, mm. you know what I mean? And half of that was probably, you know, sort of waiting to get funds to go racing again. So that initial, you know, Gordon had that call, you know, I was part of the MSA, they said, look, you know, Jack Russell's going to be sort of a good rider, let's just give him a shout. So he sort of rang me up and said, do you fancy doing this TT and sort of following on from that side of things? You know, we'll get, I'll take you across and show you around. Thank you for the offer, but no thanks. You know, because at the end, of that is a huge thing. Yeah. I can race yeah. around Cadwell Park and enjoy it. I was watching on boards. I didn't got a clue what was going on. Yeah. You know, and I was like, not a chance. But obviously when this Iraq side of things scuppered the, the BSB side of things. Bloody wars. Bloody wars. Uh, yeah. What was the time frame between that then and then actually deciding? And about being, a year. About oh, right. a year. So it was about a year later. What, from when you actually turned up on the island? and, and uh, Well, it was a year after that. So so say two March years, previously, yeah. uh, I'd been sort of said, you know, do you fancy doing the Isle of Man? Because yeah. I think that was his last year, 2006 or whenever it was. Uh, and I was like, yeah, thanks, but no. Um Obviously, then the next March time, I got my, well, September, I got my call up to go to Iraq. So I was like, well, that's going to scupper the whole BSB. And that's when COG started turning. And I do remember a conscious decision thinking, well, I can't do a full season of BSB. And I really couldn't afford to anyway, to mm. be fair. Um, um, let's have a look at dates. And it literally fell that I came back two weeks, I think it was, before the Manx Grand Prix. So I sort of spoke to the ACU while I was in Iraq, gave him a ring, gave Michelle a ring, uh, who's amazing. Hats off to Michelle. She's amazing. And uh, She is, to be fair. She she's sorted just, out all my stuff from my injury Absolutely stuff love her to well. pieces. You know, the whole ACU is mega, don't get me wrong. But, you know, she sorted me right out. She said, look, you know, I'll put it to the board. And they said, look, you've done Superstock the year before. Obviously not very well. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, you can get the, the tick in the box to go to do the Manx Grand Prix. So that was it. We landed, bought a bike, came over to the Isle of Man. Never been to the Isle of Man before. And that's what I did in, the, in Iraq. Every night, I was sat in my car MX, and I just watched on in board. In your Blast shelters, you know what right, I mean? Okay. Just, just sat there watching these on boards on my little DVD player. Yeah. And I did genuinely think, after doing it solidly for sort of four or five months, and it was four or five laps a night, I thought, I know that place. Fucking damn cock loose. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> so I came off the boat, followed another van thinking he'll be going to the Manx Grand Prix. He went off somewhere else and I got to Quarter Bridge. Hold on, sorry. Sorry, Mike. So this is the first time you've ever been to the to Isle To the Isle of Man, yeah. You're rocking up to yeah. the Manx. You've not done any laps in cars. No. You've watched on boards. You've come here and you've gone, I know this place. Thought I did. Yeah. Thought I right. did. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, we got on the ferry, came across... And that was it. I, I just thought, well, and genuinely speaking, so obviously you watch the onboards, and it was lucky I had because, well, not lucky, I had, yeah. you know what I mean? I got to Quarter Bridge, I came past McDonald's following this van, and he, he went off towards like sort of Castletown Way. And I got to Quarter Bridge, and I was like, oh, this is Castletown, uh, sorry, Quarter Bridge. Bridge. Turn right here, I know that, and I, I rem this to this day, it scared the shit out of me. So you watch the onboard after onboard after onboard. It just looks flat. And it's like, God, he's going down Bray Hill, brilliant. And I got to the bottom of Bray Hill, and I was like, are we coming down that? And then like I got, waterfall, I couldn't it? get out of second gear. I was just like, fucking hell, this is, <laughs> you know, the onboards do not give it any hinds, there's just no. no height, bumps, whatever. So anyway, we eventually got my van. I mean, a old shitty Citroen that literally was busting a gut to get up Bray Hill. Got to the got saw the grandstand and I was like, all oh, right, we're here. I know where to go. Turn mm -hmm. right, happy days. Parked up, and that was it. So then we sort of unloaded a couple of bikes. I then did my first sort of full lap in the van, and we just came across. Um, but that was it, unfortunately. And and this is what you were sort of saying when you said, "What do you think of short circuits now?" At the time when I started riding bikes, all I wanted to do was become the next Shaky Burn, be a superstar. Of, of short circuits yeah. being next Lee Johnson or whoever else but it just never was to be because mm -hmm. unfortunately the first lap I did behind Chris Palmer was it and then from there as in you loved it you fell in love with it and oh. you knew that your your heart was here so I, I, straight away you loved it like because I, I 
asked different people this and it honestly took me probably 10 or 12 laps till I could and I was a bit lazy and learning you sound like you did a lot more work than me and stuff I sort of just rocked up but I know and it took me about 10 or 12 laps I remember till I tied it all together and then I had to stop thinking about where I was going and actually enjoyed riding the track do you know what I mean and then I was like this is that's when I like I thought this is really amazing but you literally it was like love at first sight well I think it's again because I was so new to riding you know and, and it was just you get onto a a, a situation where you can race this track that I'd been watching and watched previously with the VHSs, etc. Mm. And I'd seen the Davy Jeffries, the Nick Jeffries, the Joeys, all these heroes. And literally, these are fucking heroes. Mm-hmm. They'd ridden this track. And it was the weird sensation as well. So when I first raced Donington Park, it was the week after MotoGP and Rossi was, Rossi was racing there. So I literally went down Crane of Curves and in my head, I was like, oh my God. Rossi was here last week. Yeah, that, so sad, but that's what I was like. No, and of I, course, I when people like Lee come past me, I'm just like, like Jamie Coward and Mickey D came past me this year, and I was on my twin, just blasting through Kurt Michael, and they're like, boom, on their six hundred, like, that's Mickey D. Yeah. You know what I mean? I love it. So I'm always a fan. Um, always have been. Always will be. So it's funny. It's funny what he said there about he he could raid Donington Park a weekend after MotoGP was there. Doesn't matter how much money you have or whatever, you can't come and ride here on yeah. a short circuit or on a closed track, on a closed track yeah. under no circumstances. Do you know what I mean? That, that's what makes the difference. You can pay to go to Spa. You can go. You can ride anywhere that any Formula 1 car or any MotoGP track goes to, but you cannot come here. You, yeah. No matter how much money you have or whatever, you're not allowed to ride around here unless yeah. you've got a certain amount of ability, got a license, got a... You know what I mean? There's a lot yeah. of... That I think that's what makes it so special. It's, I mean, you can't very, literally just pay and come and like even like the Nurburgring. Anybody can yeah. go there, put your ticket in, and off you go. But the beauty of this one is Doris can drive it in a car. And oh yeah, yeah, you can, you can drive it, can't you? Like yeah, actually go actually do it flat it out properly. to get a, to get a closed road lap of the TT yeah. course. And this is the first year I came here for the Manx Grand Prix. I highlighted it. There was a guy I can't remember his name. So obviously we get on the newcomers bus, we do our bits with Chris and whoever else and Milky and all them. And we're going around and there's this guy who's probably about my age now, I'm joking, but he's like late 40s. His life's ambition, and this is no word of a lie, his life's ambition was to race the TT course closed roads. Because like Lee just said there, no one, unless you get to that echelons, will ever get that opportunity. Yeah, You can do as many Doris laps as you want. But to do a closed load road lap, you can't do it. So yeah. this guy, I mean, bless him, he was not the fastest racer in the world. And it took him, I think it was 15 years of racing to get his national license and get that tick in the box to say, you've got a mountain course license. And his, what, and it's, it's true to life now, he literally did his newcomers bits. We did our out lap. I was behind Chris Palmer. God knows who he was with. He did that. Then we were set free to do our first practice. He did that first practice, came in grinning like a Cheshire cat, took his levels off, cracked open a beer, retired from racing. That was him done. That was him done because he'd lived his life's ambition of doing what he wanted to do, which was race that course. And I was like, fair fucking play, lad. Yeah. You know, and there's been one or two that you you sort of take your hat off to and go, when time's time, you know when that time is. You know, whether they've been racing here for years or like this guy, I can't remember his name, but I was just like, do you know what? Fair that play. is absolutely magical because to him that was the world cup yeah that was just, just to race this course or ride this course he wanted to be yeah. doing a race yeah yeah just to ride that course for that one lap or two laps i think he did as a closed road for him was literally like winning the lottery and he retired a happy man he literally enjoyed the rest of the manx and that's where the Manx is different, that's where the Isle of Man's different in yeah. terms of the circuit's different, the mentality's it's, different. Yeah, it's you can't. Well, far, far more people have claimed Everest than have raced at the TT. Yeah. Do you know anyone that's claimed Everest? Yeah. No, no, no you no. don't. No. Exactly. <laughs> I was like, you just ruined my story. But like, <laughs> like that's like I, I've, I've no, I've never. Yeah. You know what I mean? And far more people have claimed Everest than have raced at the TT. Mm. I think that's. There's a lot of nostalgia for me as well behind it. Yeah. So I go and race. Donington Park and I'm like this is mint because it is any chance to ride a bike for me yeah. is mint but for me around the TT course 
it is just a different. I can't describe it, and that's don't the hard try thing and describe about it because you can't. I'm just gonna because there is no. You'll no be words. fitter whenever you get in the back of this side car. You can then put it into words. Yeah. I am a I am a wordsmith, a wordsworth. <laughs> Is that the right? Jobs were off. Jobs were off. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, we're going to have to stop you there. There's still loads to talk about. We will be back next week with the follow-up to this episode. Check this clip out. I've only got probably another two or three years of solo racing where I'm aiming for top tens. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas sidecar, you can hopefully carry on. It's an older man sport, let's face it. Yeah. You know, um, he says that not normal old men race sidecars. This is not. It's not. No. A, yeah, you know what mean? He says that like he's a, going yeah. to play a croquet. Or, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not. A, you don't get Croc- to sixty-five. Croquet balls. I'm, Croquet's I'm, got the adrenaline buzz. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. gonna. I'm gonna go to the TT when I'm sixty-five <laughs> and race a sidecar. And you can watch that first right here on TT Plus. Until then, see you next week, guys. Yeah.